Mayor Creamy, aye. There are ten ayes. The budget is passed on first reading. Thank you, colleagues. Next item, please. Item 36. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. We have to have a separate roll call on. Thank you, Supervisor McGoldrick, for reminding me that we divided out the $200,000 for uh, the depending on what you want to call them, safety or surveillance cameras. And on that item in the annual appropriations ordinance, a roll call, please. Supervisor you, Peskin. No, I'm sorry, Supervisor Su McGoldrick. Su Supervisor Peskin, I'll be, ber I'll be ber very, very brief. Again, it's, uh, it's under here called uh, domestic violence. Uh, excuse me, it's the one that uh, it's security cameras. It's called it's $200,000. Uh, the line on the ad back list is, uh, looks like 111. Okay, the, the reason I want to vote against this is because, unfortunately, it, what is happening is what I thought was going to happen. That little by little, trickle by trickle, the question of our civil liberties, the question of our right to move about and congregate freely uh, and not be suspect, uh, 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 unduly suspect, is what is occurring here. And when we were told that we were going to get some pilot project cameras, that was one thing. But bit by bit by bit, the erosion, I think, of civil liberties issues here by these kind of uh, cameras being put all over the place uh, is something that I think we're going to live to regret. And I just want to make sure to make the point that uh, you know we, we, we do not have any substantial evidence. The ACLU has given me mountains of materials. There have been studies done uh, in England where you've got more cameras than probably anywhere in the globe. And while you might get the uh, uh, impression, uh, 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 sometimes uh, uh, illusion, that you're buying protection, there are so many other ways to expend public funds and not to trample upon civil liberties that that question has to be asked, that debate has to take place, and when it simply comes across as another little item that uh, somebody gets into their budget uh, without us debating the issue, I think we are in a situation in which we have uh, essentially gone to sleep at the wheel. And I do not think that the uh, mayor's office should be sending this, these sorts of items. I think the mayor's office should be taking seriously what this board did when we said we would allow a pilot project, which I objected to it anyway, but my colleagues, with all due respect, uh, I, 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 I respect the, you know, your collective wishes uh, as something that reflects if you would, the wisdom or sagacity of our community. That's going forward, but this is just going to be more of the same, and I cannot, uh, I cannot subscribe to it, and I would ask that you would vote against this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Sandoval? Uh, determine how many cameras and where they're being located? There was extensive discussion about this in committee, and there was a number of cameras that were discussed. There was both rehabilitation of existing cameras and the addition of some new cameras, and I, for the life of me, could not recall the details of that conversation. I don't know if we have staff here who has the line item detail. Ms. Coloretti, do you remember the answer to that? Sure, Supervisor Nani, Colorado Mayor's Budget Office. Uh, there are 64 existing cameras and 25 new cameras. The existing cameras are currently located in the Bayview, the Hunters number Point, Western number. Edition, and Mission. Uh, I think there's one in my district. My question is, the question is, where are the new cameras going? And the location of the new cameras. And I believe that money was put on reserve. Isn't that correct? That's, it's reserve. And the money was put on reserve pending that level of detail, Supervisor? Is, does that, is that satisfactory? Or? Not until I get some cameras, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Mercurimi? Hi. Just for information on process, this is on hold by the police commission. So there is no expending dollars for new cameras unless approved by the police commission to make it so, and that they have paused the whole camera pro program, I think, until we hear otherwise. And pending hearing from the police department, we did put the money on reserve. So on the item, the last remaining item on the it's, it's first reading of the AAO, a roll call, please. Supervisor Peskin. Reserve. Aye. Peskin, aye. Supervisor Sandoval. Aye. Sandoval, aye. Supervisor Aliotto Pier. Aliotto Pier, aye. Supervisor Ramiano. Motion. I need to hear it. This is on the $200,000 for the cameras. He wants to the motion is to delete them. Well, how about we make a motion to rescind, made by Supervisor Ramiano, second by Supervisor Duffy. Without objection, the vote is rescinded. This is a divided out portion of the budget by Supervisor McGoldrick with regard to $200,000 for safety or security cameras uh, or surveillance cameras. 
and Supervisor McGoldrick is urging a no vote. And on the item, a roll call, please. Supervisor Peskin. Aye. Peskin, aye. Supervisor Sandoval. Aye. Sandoval, aye. Supervisor Elliot O'Pier. Elliot O'Pier, aye. Supervisor Amiano. Aye. Amiano, aye. Supervisor Daly. Daly, no. Supervisor Dufty. Dufty, aye. Supervisor Ellsburn. Ellsburn, aye. Supervisor Jew. Jew, aye. Supervisor Maxwell. Maxwell, no. Supervisor McGoldrick. McGoldrick, no. Supervisor Mirakrimi. No. Mirakrimi, no. There are seven ayes and four noes. The ordinance passes on first reading. Next item, please. Well, let's see. We do have a special order 330, special order commendations. Are there any special order commendations today? Supervisor Dufty. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm uh, joined by Supervisor Amiano. Uh, I wanted to invite, uh, first, if I can invite Joe Nyson from New Leaf uh, to come forward. And uh, at the same time, I believe uh, Ana Damiani is here from... Uh, Assemblyman Leno's office. Is Anna here? Welcome, Mr. Nyson. Why don't you come on up? Can if you could go over to the podium over there. Uh, thank you, colleagues and members of the public. We are here to recognize and congratulate Joe Nyson for 11 years of leadership of New Leaf services to our community. And New Leaf uh, was merged years ago to create a single agency addressing the mental health and substance abuse needs of the LGBT community. And Joe has done an incredible job and after 11 years uh, is moving on to new challenges and happily for us uh, going to be working with UCSF. Uh, if I could take a moment to uh, uh, read uh, this resolution and uh, present it to Joe. And I believe your uh, is your board president here as well. Chris Sinton is here. Yes. So why don't we invite Chris to come up? So, whereas Joe Nyson has shaped, guided, and led New Leaf services for our community with outstanding vision and direction for 11 years, and whereas New Leaf is the only comprehensive mental health, substance abuse, HIV/AIDS, and social service organization in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, specifically designed to address the unique mental health needs of the LGBT community, and whereas New Leaf's clinical excellence, coupled with its diverse clientele, has made the agency a national model, and whereas Joe Nyson has evolved New Leaf's business plan, steadily increasing revenue streams, and where Whereas this has resulted in a continued increase in major support from foundations, corporations, private donors, direct mail campaigns, and an annual signature event which ensures that New Leaf will remain an integral part of the LGBT community. And whereas under Joe Nyson's leadership, after 30 years, New Leaf has consolidated its operations in one site. And whereas Joe has contributed nationally through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA sponsored introductory manual for providers specializing in substance abuse treatment for LGBT and individuals, and whereas in 2003 Joe Nyson received the California Association of Nonprofits Statewide Excellence and Leadership Award for Nonprofit Executive Director of the Year, and whereas Joe Nyson has decided to pursue new challenges and his dedication, good-natured persistence, and thoughtfulness that has led New Leaf for the past 11 years will be greatly missed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the City and County of San Francisco does hereby honor and commend Joe Nyson for his service to the city and the LGBT community and wishes him every success in his next steps and future endeavors. Congratulations, Mr. Nyson. So uh, I was going to let Chris say, take a minute and then have Joe speak. So this is Chris Sinton from the Board of Directors in New Leaf. Thank you, Supervisor Dusty, Dufty, and thank you, uh, Supervisors. Joe, I just want to say that uh, your service and dedication has changed a huge number of lives in this community. And on behalf of the board and the community that we represent, I want to say thank you. And Ana Damiani is now here, and I'd like to welcome her up to uh, provide uh, some of the Menlo's proclamation. Good afternoon, Ms. Damiani. Welcome. Why don't you come on up, Anna, and then we'll turn the floor over to Joe. Good afternoon, Mr. President, board members, Joe. It's my pleasure to represent Assemblyman Mark Leno today. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here himself because he's in Sacramento. But he asked me to come on his behalf, 
And I have a certificate of recognition from the California State Assembly for Joe. And it reads, congratulations as you are joined by friends, colleagues, and well-wishers in celebration of 11 years of service to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community through your exemplary leadership at New Leaf Services for our community. It is through the commitment and dedication of caring individuals such as you that lives are changed and the future made brighter for many. I wish you well in your future adventures. Congratulations, and thank you for all you do. And it's signed, Mark Leno, Assemblyman, 13th District. Congratulations, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And, Joe, I want to have Supervisor Amiano join in the recognition, and then, then you can speak. Thank okay. You. Supervisor Amiano. <clears throat> Just briefly, Joe, thank you so much for uh, so many years of service. It really is hard to hang in there. Uh, and uh, I think when you're on the inside, as you have been, um, uh, I think you've seen it all, and your commitment never wavered. And uh, uh, it really is our loss that you're leaving, but uh, I understand that everybody needs a future, too, as well. But I think you should rest assured that um, – the example that you set, the work ethic, uh, the principle, uh, left a very high standard uh, for people to meet, and that, that's a great contribution. Thank you so much. I just wanted to offer a few brief uh, comments, and first of all, a special thank you to Supervisor Dufty and Amiano also. I appreciate your, your kind comments and all the work we've accomplished over the years, and many of the other members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, we appreciate not only all of the support that you've provided for New Leaf over the 11 and a half years that I've been uh, at New Leaf, but also the support that you provide to countless other nonprofits in the city because we really are the critical safety net and provide services to many of the most vulnerable members of the community. So the nonprofit uh, partnership that we have with the Department of Public Health, for example, is really critical. and. Thank you for your ongoing support of all of our institutions and, and that kind of partnering. And I really appreciate these awards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for all of your work. <laughs> Madam Clerk, if we can return to our regular agenda, item 36. Item 36 is a resolution concurring with the controller's certification that services can be performed by private contractor for a lower cost than similar work performed by city and county employees for golf course maintenance services at the Department of Recreation and Park. Supervisor Maxwell. Thank you. Colleagues, I am inclined to vote for this item. I think we have spent a great deal of money on, on these golf courses, and I think it's important that we try our best to get our money back. And I think that over the years, people have found through many studies that municipalities um, own 70 percent of the golf courses. However, they don't do very well with them, and over 90 percent of them are not doing well. And so I, th I think it may be to our advantage at this point to consider this item. But before we do, there's also a study uh, that the Budget and Finance Committee um, put forth, I think it was about $35,000, and that study would take a look at all of our golf courses. We have over 400 acres uh, of golf courses and only 24 acres of soccer fields. I think it's important that we really take a look at what's going on. We take a look at... Um, when we talk about families, how are we really dealing with our families? And is golf the most important and this amount of acreage, is it appropriate for a city of our size? And so I would like to uh, continue this item and, and perhaps have it go to the committee, back to the committee and be heard at the same time that the study is to be done. I think that might be a good action for us and I ask for your support. The study may take, maybe we've heard um, 
from three to six months. So it's not as if it would take a long time. And I understand also that there would not be a fiscal impact. So I ask for your support. Motion made by Supervisor Maxwell to re-refer this item to the Budget and Finance Committee pending completion of the study that was part of the add backs in the annual appropriations ordinance. Is there a second for that? Seconded by Supervisor McGoldrick to the motion made and seconded. Uh, Supervisor McGoldrick, Supervisor. I would just associate myself with the comments of my colleague, Supervisor Maxwell. Indeed, there are a lot of questions to be answered. There are a lot of questions to be posed. Thank you. Supervisor Ellsburn. Thank you, President Peskin. Um, you know, first, uh, let me start by thanking Supervisor Maxwell for indicating her willingness to support this item, uh, of course, upon completion of the study. But a couple things that I think need to be raised. Um, you know, is the general manager here? Mr. Agunbiadi, if you could come forward. General Manager Agunbiadi. Um, my understanding, Yomi, is that this study that we have now approved in the budget doesn't even look at Harding, Fleming, or Lincoln, which are the three courses that are subject of the Proposition J. Is that correct? That's correct. So I, I guess I'm just a little confused as to why we would wait for a study that doesn't even talk about the three courses that are subject of the Proposition J. And then the second point I would make, what this Proposition J does is it gives the department the ability to move forward on a RFP process, which is not going to be concluded in three months or six months. It's going to take 12 months. So by the time the proposed contract comes back to us, we're going to have the results of this study in hand. Yeah. And by delaying this, we're just delaying the process of moving forward on this and setting ourselves up for fiscal year 0809, another general fund subsidy which everyone has said is inappropriate and is the only reason we're in this position in the first place. So while I very much appreciate, Supervisor Maxwell, your willingness to at least look at this, which is very appreciated. I can't tell you how appreciated this is because, frankly, I've talked to a lot of folks who just won't even consider it. So thank you for that. I just don't see how waiting for this study in any way <coughs> provides guidance to the question of the contract when it completely ignores the other courses. Supervisor Mercurimi. Well, I, I appreciate certainly Supervisor Maxwell's intention and the feedback from Supervisor Ellsburn, but since I was the one who initiated the effort with the Neighborhood Parks Council and I think Parks and Recreation Community Advocates at large for the $35,000 study, I think there might be some disagreement in terms of what is supposed to be encompassed in the particular study. I would uh, beg to differ uh, in terms of the recollection of when the money, I think at least was advanced, that it would include both the three golf courses in question. I think Neighborhood Parks Council would also probably agree with that. So I think Supervisor Maxwell's motion uh, is consistent or intact. Uh, at least with the spirit, I think, of what uh, Supervisor Maxwell is intending to do. I think our study uh, within a six-month time frame, I don't know about three, would support that endeavor. Supervisor McGoldrick. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, uh, if you would, uh, I think that uh, what we have before us is an opportunity to actually have a hearing that uh, probably actually should have been held even before this thing ever came to us as simply a budget item. This is far too important uh, an item to simply go through as a, if you look at the uh, resolution here on the Prop J item, barely a page and a few lines to take a hundred years, a century's worth of public uh, investment in public lands that are hundreds of acres and to reduce it down to a piece of paper that barely weighs a few grams, that is barely a sheet of paper, I think is a disservice to the public and a disservice to the process that we need here. The reference to committee gives us time to be able to actually ask questions, get answers, do analysis, do comparables, find out what it is that we've got on the table here. I think that uh, the problem we have here is that this is being rammed and jammed through so quickly that folks hardly know what's happening. There's hardly been uh, any kind of really uh, compounding of the problem uh, uh, beyond what we see here. And rather than see it get compounded any further, I just want to say I think the referencing to the committee is a good first start in terms of ever being able to get some discussion going here. Thank you. Supervisor Maxwell. 
I, I was just going to, I think, agree with Supervisor Mirakarimi that maybe those golf courses should be added to the study as well if they're not. Thank you. Supervisor Ellsberg. So just to be clear then on that point, Supervisor Maxwell, you want to add to the study uh, a golf course that just four years ago we invested $20 million in to change it into something else? Is that correct? Supervisor as, Maxwell. As Supervisor Mirakarimi mentioned, that that was his understanding all along. And since you said since it was not going to be studied, I don't think it's that difficult. I think yes. I think even though we made that investment again, I made it clear that I am certainly for it. But I, I certainly would not mind looking at that as well. We are talking about Harding. We're talking about Fleming. Fleming is inside of Harding. That's a nine, um, a smaller golf course. Who knows? So maybe we should look at all of that. Colleagues, on the item to re-refer to the Budget and Finance Committee pending the outcome of the aforementioned study, can we do that without objection or do we need a roll call? Roll call, please. Supervisor Peskin. Aye. Peskin, aye. Supervisor Sandoval. Sandoval, no. Supervisor Aliotto Pier. Aliotto Pier, no. Supervisor Ramiano. Aye. Ramiano, aye. Supervisor Daly. Daly, aye. Supervisor Dufty. Dufty, no. Supervisor Ellsburn. Ellsburn, no. Supervisor Jew. No. Jew, no. Supervisor Maxwell. Maxwell, aye. Supervisor McGoldrick. Aye. McGoldrick, aye. Supervisor Mir Karimi. Mir Karimi, aye. There are six ayes and five noes. The item is re referred. Next item, please. Item 37 is a charter amendment to renew the Library Preservation Fund for 15 years and to authorize the City and County of San Francisco to issue debt for library purposes. Roll call. Supervisor Peskin? Aye. Peskin, aye. Supervisor Sandoval? Aye. Yes. Sandoval, aye. Supervisor Alioto Pier? Alioto Pier. Alioto Pier, aye. Supervisor Ramiano. Ramiano, aye. Supervisor Daly. Daly, no. Supervisor Dufty. Dufty, aye. Supervisor Ellsburn. Ellsburn, aye. Supervisor Jew. Jew, no. Supervisor Maxwell. Maxwell, aye. Supervisor McGoldrick. McGoldrick, aye. Supervisor Mir Creamy. Mir Creamy, aye. There are nine ayes and two noes. The Charter Amendment is submitted. Item 38 is a Charter Amendment to require the Mayor to appear personally at one regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Supervisors each month to engage in formal policy discussions with members of the Board and to authorize the Board to adopt rules and guidelines. Any comments? Seeing none on the item, a roll call please. Supervisor Peskin. Aye. Peskin, aye. Supervisor Sandoval. Sandoval, aye. Supervisor Alioto Pier. Alioto Pier, no. Supervisor Amiano. Amiano, aye. Supervisor Daly. Daly, aye. Supervisor Dufty. Dufty, no. Supervisor Ellsburn. Ellsburn, no. Supervisor Jew. No. Jew, no. Supervisor Maxwell. No. Maxwell, no. Supervisor McGoldrick. Aye. McGoldrick, aye. Supervisor Mir Karimi. Aye. Mir Karimi, aye. There are six ayes and five noes. Charter amendment is submitted. <coughs> Next item, please. Item 39 is a charter amendment to provide that the Municipal Transportation Agency's budget shall be subject to the city's normal budget process and subject to regulation by the Board of Supervisors and the controller, rather than the agency, shall administer the bienni biennial Municipal Transportation Quality Review Survey and Study. Supervisor McGoldrick. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. I want to introduce some amendments uh, I've just given to the clerk, uh, hot off the press, so I hope they don't burn your fingers. Not too complicated. Incorporate some of the uh, 
No, some of the uh, provisions certainly that uh, I think we've got uh, still under consideration and uh, the item that is uh, presented to us uh, along with the package of uh, charter amendments that uh, Supervisor uh, President Peskin has set forth. Uh, again, uh, the, the heart of this is uh, still the same, uh, giving the governance uh, over the budget uh, back to the Board of Supervisors uh, in the interest of having accountability. Uh, the accountability through uh, the seven appointees that are part of the MTA uh, is not the same as the accountability of 11 elected uh, public officials who the, the, the voters look to directly and say, we elected you and you and you and you and you and you and we expect you to perform. When we see the problems with Muni, as we've seen uh, more recently, uh, as much as ever, and still seven years after Prop B, uh, in dire straits, uh, it is time to take some measures. And I understand certainly the, the, the impetus behind uh, Supervisor Peskin's uh, uh, MTA reform package is to try to find some way to get a handle on Muni. I say that the, the first way to get a handle back on Muni is to put it back in the hands of those who are most directly elected by the people of San Francisco. Right now, the only folks who really get to do much about Muni are the folks who are appointed by the executive branch. Nothing personal with Mayor Newsom. It could have been Mayor Brown. It could have been my mother, Mayor, my mother. You know, It doesn't matter to me. What is important is that we have this kind of line of accountability. And so that's the, that, that's the first important piece here, is that the budget, as we're just doing the budget here today, would come to the Board of Supervisors, not just for a thumbs up or thumbs down on the whole thing. Uh, I think we've all had our experience in wishing that somehow or other we could have effectuated some changes at Muni. And a lot of the voters don't know, most voters don't know, Muni gets to be run like a pretty darn independent agency, and I think that's part of the problem we've got right now. The other issues here uh, that I've uh, introduced, uh, uh, borrowing again from uh, Supervisor Peskins, uh, is the uh, uh, not less than provision in terms of the, uh, the, the language used here is car men, an old-fashioned word, the drivers, uh, but the car men and car women, it doesn't, it, 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 the old language is left in here. My apologies for the gender reference we could perhaps uh, deal, deal with that another time, but uh, the language that's in there for, for decades, uh, to change it to uh, not less than, so that it would be a minimum, a minimum on the uh, requirements uh, where the beginning is in terms of negotiations. I think that brings, if you would, the drivers uh, 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 to the table in terms of the kinds of things that people want. People want to be able to have accountability there again. So it's another accountability issue in which labor has to be accountable, and you get the uh, performance standards, you get uh, all kinds of uh, uh, expectations and you can do that as part of the negotiating process. There has not had to be too much of a negotiation uh, for a long time due to the charter language that said it was already a guaranteed uh, maximum uh, and now if you make it a minimum it's a starting point. And uh, God bless us, while people may think the drivers make a lot of money, if you look at the salaries, the drivers aren't getting too rich on those salaries folks. They're really not making as much as uh, people uh, sort of think that they're making, you know. Uh, so, anyway, moving on that one. The other would give authorization uh, back uh, to the, um, what used to be called the general manager. Uh, what is the title now? Executive director. Uh, it's changed in recent years, but uh, currently uh, Nat Ford is in that position. But give him the authorization uh, to be able to have uh, control over the parking authority. The parking authority, I think, needs a direct line of authorization that comes to the very top. And the very top there, again, just as the Board of Supervisors is the top in terms of uh, authorization powers the, and, 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 and governance issues, uh, the, uh, the, the executive director would have the uh, power over the parking authority executive director, and I think that's only appropriate. Right now, that has not been the situation. I present these, uh, I present these amendments and would ask you if we could uh, pass them, uh, uh, put them forward uh, to, for consideration next week. As you know, under the rules, we have to put forth the, uh, um, uh, the, rec uh, the amendments, and then they have to sit a week. So I would ask if you would please uh, second these and put them forward and then consider between now and next week whether you colleagues as a majority uh, would be willing to put this forth to the voters. Thank you. Motion made by Supervisor McGoldrick to amend the aforementioned charter amendment. Is there a second for that? Second by Supervisor Mercurimi. Colleagues, can we do that without objection? Uh, the item will be continued one week to a committee of the whole. <coughs> colleagues, it is now four minutes after four, and we have a special order at 4 p.m. Madam Clerk, could you please read items 49 through 52? Item 49 is a hearing of persons interested in or objecting to the decision of the Planning Department adopted and issued on April 19, 2007 for an appeal of the final mitigated negative declaration for 3400 Cesar Chavez Street. 
for the proposed demolition and the existing building and construction of a new four-story building that would house a Walgreens store and up to three other small retail spaces on the ground floor, as well as a 60, one, two, and three bedroom owner-occupied residential units above. Item 50 is a motion affirming Planning Commission adoption of the final mitigated negative declaration for the 3400 Cesar Chavez Street project. Item 51 is a motion reversing the Planning Commission adoption of the final mitigated negative declaration for the 3400 Cesar Chavez Street project. And item 52 is a motion directing the Clerk of the Board to prepare findings reversing the Planning Commission adoption of the final mitigated negative declaration for the 3400 Cesar Chavez Street project. Thank you, Madam Clerk, colleagues, members of the public. This is a hearing on the adequacy, thoroughness, and completeness of the environmental document for 3400 Cesar Chavez, in this case, a final mitigated negative declaration. With your indulgence, colleagues, I thought, given the extraordinary number of individuals here to testify uh, both in favor uh, and against the appeal, that we might run this hearing slightly differently than we normally run them, and I would recommend the following. Uh, ten minutes for the appellant, not to exceed ten minutes for the appellant. Then we go directly to the department for their response. Then we will go to the real party in interest uh, or their representative uh, for a not to exceed ten minute uh, response. And then why don't we go to public comment? And this is slightly uh, a change from the way we normally do it. We usually do speakers on behalf of the appellant, then speakers on behalf of the real party in interest. But given the extraordinary volume of people uh, here, uh, our deputy clerk suggested that why don't we take those all after we have the briefings from the appellant, the department, and the real party in interest or the representative, and then go to public testimony uh, and we can get that both from people in favor and opposed as they come up. I think we're all smart enough to digest the arguments on uh, all sides. Is that acceptable to you, colleagues, as a suggestion? Supervisor Ellsburn. The only question I have is what about the three-minute rebuttal? Then at the end of the public comment, we would go back to the appellant for a three-minute rebuttal. Then the only hesitation I have with that is typically when the uh, project sponsor gives their presentation, in that presentation they have a chance to respond to a great deal of the public comment on behalf of the appeal. In this case, they will not have that opportunity. If it is uh, suitable, I would amend my recommendation and have the three-minute rebuttal come directly after the real party in interest or the representative, if that is acceptable to That's you, fine. colleagues. Ms. Hester, on that. My question is, could someone please go out and announce this to all the people in the hall? We will have the deputy sheriff go out there and let everybody know that we will have the back and forth and then go to the speakers. And could he let people in? There's a lot of seats left. Yeah, as when we get to that part, everybody can line up, and I know that there is a line down the hall, and I don't know if my staff had the time to suggest this to you. This idea came up a couple of hours ago and I asked staff to speak to uh, the appellant and to the real party in interest. I don't know given the budget whether or not that got to you or Nick or to uh, the real party in interest and their representatives. Nick, I'm Nick did that I'm get to you? Did that message get to you, Nick? Yeah. Thank you. Sue Hester, attorney for the Mission Under okay, Displacement. So why, why don't we set the clock at 10 minutes? Is the clock set, Madam Clerk? The floor is yours. Okay. This project is in an NC3 zone in the Mission, at Mission and Cesar Chavez. It is a corner, the northwest corner of Cesar Chavez and Mission. It has been a Kelly Moore paint store, wholesale and retail, for ten years before it was closed because of this project. The project that is before you is a 60 unit housing, 60 unit housing project with a 12,000 square foot retail, i.e. a Walgreens. It will be the sixth Walgreens within a mile of this site. 
The issues that are key to this project is the integrity of the Eastern Neighborhoods planning process. People in the Mission, South of Market, and Petrero have been stressed out by uncontrolled market rate housing development and loss of PDR, which is the lingo these days for light industrial, for about 12 years. It started in the live work wars, and I think members of the board are intimately familiar with that and the and what happened because it brought many of you to the board of supervisors. It took a long time to get the planning department to be willing to do a rezoning and area plans. We had to bash them about the heads, as did this board, to tell them to start the Eastern Neighborhood Planning process. The process has been going on for several years, and it kind of puttered along for a long time and started going towards the end of 2005, not that long ago. When you re last confronted a project in the eastern neighborhoods, it was 2660 Harrison Street, and I was here before you because that project, again, like this one, was market rate housing on a PDR site. This board gave some guidance. It rejected the neg deck and gave guidance for how projects, in the case of that project, were to be looked at. And the guidance was in two areas. It was on look at how you're affecting the supply of PDR, but also look at it in terms of affordable housing policy. That is the 2660 resolution and it's attached to my brief. The second time you really seriously looked at the Eastern Neighborhoods process was in January when you gave instructions, this board gave instructions to the planning department and the planning commission on what it expected to have when the Eastern Neighborhoods came back. And there were detailed instructions on housing. And the housing instructions were that they were really supposed to be looking at the housing element and the policies in the housing element and look for affordable housing sites because we in the mission want affordable housing. What the planning department did was started to process projects after a brief hiatus after 2660 Harrison and they started processing projects on the grounds that oh these aren't in, in, in industrial areas these are in neighborhood commercial districts this is one of the ones that they have started approving what no one seems to deal with in the planning department is the eastern neighborhoods are the entire neighborhoods. It's the NC zones as well as the residential zones as well as the industrial zones. What we have is an MEA that doesn't talk to each other. Mr. Yacinto, who is not here, is the person in charge of the Eastern Neighborhoods Draft EIR, which was released on, on June 20th, pardon me, June 30th. I do not have any sense that his work informs this, this this neg deck. In fact, I'm pretty positive it doesn't. One of the things that also is a problem is I don't think that the Eastern Neighborhood's staff work on planning is informing environmental review. If they had looked in the EIR or if they'd talked to staff, they would have found out that this site is designated PDR. Kelly Moore is a big paint company and that's all they do is retail and wholesale. Contractors line up to get their paint there. And so every paint site, in, in the, and it's attached to my brief, is called PDR. It's one exception, and it was a, miscal a misidentification uh, in the staff work. But what we've got is a PND that says we're going to look at this project in the light of all of these policies, but then doesn't. There's not one mention in the neg deck about the Eastern Neighborhoods Resolution that this board adopted on January 9th. Not one. You go through a lot of work to say, here's the policies we want, here's what we want on housing, here are the goals we want, which is 64% affordable housing overall in the Eastern Neighborhoods, and this project has 85% market rate housing. Another thing that the Eastern Neighborhoods is going to do is abolish PUDs. Why? Because the PUDs gives you extra density, and the, and the basic core approach of every Eastern Neighborhood and Market Octavia and all the other rezonings that go on is that you get something for extra. 
and we want ad ad additional affordable housing for the extra density in the eastern neighborhoods. That has been discussed ad nauseum by staff at the, at the hearings. That is one of the things we want. This project gets nine extra units of housing for zero. They should be nine additional affordable units. We need to be looking at, in MEA, what is going on in the rest of the department. I think they have too many walls up. There are too many barriers. I don't see Mr. Jacinto's work informing this at all. If it did, it would look at the Eastern Neighborhood policies. It would say what we are doing on affordable housing. Mr. Rich's staff in the Eastern Neighborhoods should have evaluated this because as you read this, it doesn't talk about PDR and the importance of PDR the way we talk about it in long-term planning and even in the EIR for long-term planning. There is a, a Walgreens that is not consistent with where we're going on the Eastern Neighborhood Planning Process, but it isn't looked at in those eyes in this neg deck. A 12,000 square foot Walgreens is huge. A 12,000 square foot Walgreens at an intersection of Cesar Chavez and, Her and Mission Street has the potential to have serious disruptive uh, impacts on traffic. Those of us who live in the neighborhood know that Cesar Chavez has a lot of traffic going west to go south on Guerrero to get to the freeway. We know that the housing that has been built in the eastern neighborhoods in the past couple of years, including the live work, that's anywhere near a freeway entrance, is, is very attractive to people who work in Silicon Valley. I have been pleading with staff in the department who do environmental analysis on transportation issues to get the data that says, who is this housing going to serve? Because all we do is we do rote transportation analysis. We assume that everyone who's going into these new housing units right next to freeway ramps are going to say they have the same travel characteristics as the rest of the city. And that is not correct. If we provide attractive market rate housing that is near freeway ramps, it is going to be occupied by Silicon Valley. This is not going to be housing for low-income people in the mission. Why? How do we know that? Because we know who's moving into the stuff that's already there. So this neg deck has structural problems. It does not relate to the Eastern Neighborhood's EIR. It does not relate to the policies this board has adopted after multiple hearings. It does not talk about the Eastern Neighborhood's planning process in anything like where it is right now. They look to what was happening five years ago, not to what is happening in the Eastern Neighborhood's planning in 2007. We, I, you got, I saw them trucking this in. I asked planning to deliver this, and Mr. Jacinto wasn't in yesterday, so it came over today. This is the Eastern Neighborhood's EIR that came out on the, on the, on the 30th. Some of us are still plowing through it. What you will find in it is the map of the mission, and it's attached to my brief, that shows this site is PDR in the eyes of long-term planning. The eyes of long-term planning, which is doing a study, which is very important to this board as well as very important to the community, it should influence what MEA does. It didn't. It doesn't. It's why this, this, EI, this neg deck is not sufficient and why it needs to be looked at in terms of the Eastern Neighborhoods EIR and the Eastern Neighborhoods planning process and how you look at PDR and how you look at giving goodies, which is what a PUD is. Nine additional units is a huge, huge windfall for a 51 unit project as of right. We are asking you to turn down the neg deck, tell them to go back and look at it in the light of the EIR that was released and also in the light of your own instructions, both in the Eastern Neighborhoods Resolution from January and 2660 Harrison. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hester. Now we will go to the planning department for a not to exceed 10 minute presentation. Ms. Wise. Good afternoon, President Seskin, members of the board. Victoria, I think you need to turn your microphone on. It's on? It's on? Okay. Um, can you, can you, can you hear me? Go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, President Peskin, members of the board. I'm Victoria Wise, Planning Department staff. I'm sorry the Environmental Review Officer could not be here today. Paul Mar Walter is on vacation. I think he's retired, actually. Yes, Bo both of those. Um, the subject of the hearing is the adequacy of the environmental document. Several weeks ago, you received a packet of information from us which responded in detail to the written appeal and included a number of attachments with pertinent background information. I'd like to take this opportunity to just focus on a few key issues. The first one has to do with traffic. Prior to the publication of the NEC deck, the department conducted a comprehensive transportation study for the proposed project. That transportation study looked at project-specific and cumulative impacts of this project and concluded that the project would not result in significant impacts with respect to traffic, transit, pedestrian and bicycle safety, and parking. As far as cumulative impacts go, the traffic analysis showed that the project's share of future traffic growth at intersections that would operate at unacceptable levels of service in 2025 would not be considerable. And with respect to existing collisions at the intersection of Mission and Cesar Chavez, something that was brought up in the appeal, the project's effects on the rate of collision would also not be substantial. Additionally, the project's proposed widenings of portions of the sidewalk adjacent to the project site and the Department of Parking and Traffic uh, proposal to create sidewalk bulb outs at the northeast, northwest, and southeast corners of the intersection of Caesar Chavez and Mission would be expected to improve pedestrian conditions. The second point I want to address is the board's findings for the NEG DAC appeal of the 2660 Harrison Street project as raised with, in relation to this appeal. Max appeal letter states that this board directed the department to analyze the cumulative impacts of market rate housing development before approving any projects in the eastern neighborhoods. The balance have misrepresented the 2660 Harrison Stream findings and subsequent actions by this department. As you know, following the 2660 Harrison decision, our department had numerous discussions and meetings with the board in order to understand what the findings required us to analyze. The outcome of those discussions was a memorandum from the Environmental Review Officer that set forth MEA's understandings of the findings and the criteria against which projects would be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis to determine if an EIR would be required. For the last year, the analysis of pipeline projects in the eastern neighborhoods has been a set forth in that memo. And those three criteria are as follows. First. Would the project contribute to a cumulative loss of industrially zoned land, PDR jobs, and or businesses? The second question is, would the project cause conflicts between industrial and other land uses? And third, would the project adversely affect the city's ability to meet its housing needs as expressed in a general plan? Regarding the last criterion, the general plan includes goals, policies, and objectives for the city, and the planning code implements those policies by its ordinances. That is, the city has codified how to implement the general plan. So, for instance, with respect to affordable housing, Section 315 of the Planning Code would apply the Inclusionary Housing Ordinance. If a project meets the Planning Code requirements, that is, if it complies with the Inclusionary Housing Ordinance, it meets this last criterion. The criteria in the reference memo are straightforward. They do not require that individual CEQA documents study impacts of market rate housing in the eastern neighborhoods. The effect of the board's decision regarding the 2660 Harrison Street findings were discussed at length in the NEG deck, which found that the 3400 Cesar Chavez project does not meet the criteria for an EIR because first, the project would not contribute to a cumulative loss of industrially zoned land. The site is zoned NC3, and the site prior to being vacant was occupied by a retail use, and therefore would not displace any PDR jobs or businesses. Two, the proposed project would not result in a land use conflict. This is a mixed use project in a mixed use neighborhood. And three, the project complies with the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. Since the project did not meet any of the three criteria, an EIR was appropriately not required within the context of the 2660 Harrison findings. We received a submittal from Ms. Hester this morning arguing that the Kelly Moore Paint store that used to occupy the project site is a PDR use. Ms. Hester cites the Eastern Neighborhood's draft EIR land use map, which identified the project site as PDR, in support of her argument. The Eastern Neighborhood draft EIR does indeed identify the project site as PDR. However, 
The existing land use maps in the eastern neighborhoods draft AIR are intended to provide a sense of area-wide land use patterns typical of program level EIRs, while a project specific document such as the NEGDEC for the 3400 Cesar Chavez project is always more sensitive to site specific characteristics including land use. As, in the, as discussed in the NEGDEC, members of the public expressed concern regarding the loss of PDR on the site because the Kelly Moore paints store sold paint to contractors. Although information on the paint industry indicates that painting contractors tend to purchase their paint at paint company retail stores such as Kelly Moore and that these stores may offer better pricing to contractors, such stores remain retail stores and offer paint and supplies to the general public. Because they both advertise and sell directly to the general public, such retail paint stores do not fall into the category of PDR businesses. In fact, Section 790.102 of the Planning Code identifies establishments that sell household goods and services, including paint, as a retail use, and Section 790.54 identifies wholesale uses as only those exclusively providing goods for resale or businesses. Thus, the NEGDEC appropriately identified the Kelly Moore Paint Store as a retail use and concluded that the proposed project would not result in a cumulative loss of PDR jobs and or businesses. Finally, the third issue I want to touch on is socioeconomic impacts. Regarding socioeconomic impacts for the proposed Eastern Neighborhoods rezoning, it has been the long-standing approach of the Planning Department to produce two distinct and separate reports to inform the decision makers. The Eastern Neighborhoods EIR, which was published in June of this year, and the Socioeconomic Impact Report, published in March of this year. While the board did provide direction through the 2660 Harrison findings to include information and analysis in CEQA documents on the three criteria I just discussed, there's never been a change in approach regarding separating socioeconomic analysis from the EIR analysis. And as you're aware, that separation is made because CEQA analyzes physical effects on the environment, and socioeconomics are not, in and of themselves, physical environmental impacts. In conclusion, I would just like to say that while the concerns of the appellant are valid planning and policy issues, CEQA is not intended to resolve each question that may be of concern to decision makers in their evaluation of whether to approve or disapprove a particular project. CEQA looks at potential physical environmental impacts only. The written appeal does not raise new issues that were not disclosed in the NEG deck, nor does it provide substantial evidence or of a substantiated finding that the project may result in significant physical environmental impacts. The NEGDEC fully analyzed issues associated with the physical environmental impacts of this project, and we believe that it is accurate, adequate, and complete. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Does that conclude your presentation? Are there any questions for the Department, Supervisor Amiano? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Supervisor Peskin and Ms. Wise. Uh, First, uh, I, I, I asked if Mr. Franklin would, could be here because I just wanted to give this some context. So before I ask uh, questions of the department, I wonder, Mr. Franklin, I have about three questions just to clarify because there's been some contention about the Mayor's Office of Housing and its role and um, the usual Michigas. So, uh, Mr. Franklin, if, uh, if you could just clarify, the understanding is that the how the, the housing service affiliate of the Bernal Heights Neighborhood Center offered uh, 580 to purchase the property at 3400 Sager Chavez from Seven Hills based on conversations Bernal Heights had um, with your staff. And since Seven Hills has proposed to build 60 units, that works out to a land value of about 98,000 per unit. Is this a reasonable price in, uh, that Seven Hills should take seriously based on other market rate transactions? that the MOH has funded. Mr. Franklin. Thank you, uh, uh, President Peskin, Supervisor Amiano, Matt Franklin, Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, yes, the, the uh, property owner did offer the property for sale at a point in time, and we work on a very regular basis with Bernal Heights Neighborhood Corporation. Uh, they're one of our stronger community-based partners. Um, to answer your question directly, 98000 a unit is a very competitive price uh, in this neighborhood. Um, I think the other factor in this, though, is that the price was inclusive of the ground floor commercial space as well. Uh, I believe that's right. And uh, I may need clarification on this. I think it's 
15, 16,000 square feet of commercials. I frankly am, am uh, not particularly up on the, the commercial pricing pieces. Um, so I don't know what a, what a fair discount of that would be. Uh, at the time, I think our assumption was that it was more in the neighborhood of 60, 70,000 a unit, the offer. We did think it was in the range, uh, the offer, but we okay. certainly respect the right of the seller uh, to respond, you know, to uh, evaluate it in their own, uh, you know, in their own judgment. Okay. So it would be a price MOH would be willing to support if there could be an agreement between Seven Hills and, uh, and, and Bernal Heights, the Bernal Heights Neighborhood Center? Well, you know, it's certainly in the range of, of offers that, that we consider. Uh, again, though, we have, as you know, distributed a letter to all the board uh, members. Um, and, you know, we feel very strongly that when we're pursuing these discussions, that a willing seller is an important element of the uh, discussions. Okay. And uh, we all know that people are, are leaving San Francisco, and I know that your office has been working very hard. Uh, to keep people here, especially in the eastern neighborhoods where there's development uh, potential. And since Seven Hills invited an offer to the community to purchase this site from them, sh I was thinking MOH, uh, should they take this seriously as a possible development site for affordable family housing? Well, again, as, as we tried to clarify in our letter to the board, if, if the property is offered for sale by the owner, uh, and when it was uh, earlier this year, we did take a look at the site. We think it's an appropriate site for family housing of any kind, certainly including affordable housing. Affordable, house. yeah, well, okay. Uh, all right, thanks. I appreciate you being here. Um, let me just say I have two, uh, before I question the planning commission or the planning department. I have two main issues I think uh, that are particular that are at hand and one I think there's been a mischaracterization of the Kelly Moore site as retail uh, to avoid being evaluated as a project which is part of the cumulative loss of PDR and the second and very significantly I see no evidence that the planning department has heeded the board's directive to take into account the way the cumulative development affects the city's ability to meet the, the, uh, its housing needs as expressed in the general plan um, and, the impact, and the impacts on land use as well. The general plan has strong, and I emphasize strong, um, emphasis on the need for substantial amounts of below rate, uh, below market rate affordable housing and the need to identify and protect sites for that housing. Um, and those are colleagues, those of you who are listening and haven't made up your mind yet, um, I'd like you to really pay attention because I think that the decision today is, uh, could set precedents that could be deleterious to your own neighborhoods. Um, I wondered too, is, is Mr. Uh, Jacinto going to be here? No. Okay. Uh, then I need to ask you, what, what person involved with the mission planning effort reviewed the neg deck for its accuracy as to the current planning. Ms. Wise. Thank you, Ms. Wise. The negative declaration was reviewed by the environmental review officer, Paul Malter. I, I believe the question is whether who has reviewed it to determine its consistency with the draft environmental impact report for the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan, I believe is the question yes, that sorry, the supervisor that asked. The negative declaration, uh, members of the board, was actually published in December of last year, way prior to the publication of the draft DIR for the Eastern Neighborhoods. So, I don't want to put words yeah, in the supervisor's yeah, mouth, but has there been any, I understand that temporarily first came the neg deck, then came the larger EIR, but has there been any after the fact review as to whether or not the two documents are consistent? We've already heard that. You said uh, this is shown as PDR in the EIR, but we're being told <laughs> it's retail pursuant to 790.54 of the planning code under the neg deck. Has anybody looked at these and tried to bring the two together? I think that's what Supervisor Romiano is asking, and I share the same question. Ms. Roos. Roos. Hi, Carol Roos of the Planning Department. Um, there's a couple facets to your question. 
Um, number one, we work in a rather small office. Um, Ms. Weiss sits right next to Mr. Jacinto. Their cubicles uh, adjoin, and we are always having ongoing discussions. Also, Paul Maltzer, for a time, worked in the citywide section of the planning department. It was during um, an earlier portion of the Eastern Neighborhoods planning effort, which, as you know, has gone on for years. Therefore, he has uh, taken upon himself to review all the documents for environmental review that pertain to the Eastern Neighborhoods, including Mr. Jacinto's work. So we don't work in isolation. There's another thing in that, um, as Victoria mentioned, um, the Eastern Neighborhoods planning effort and its environmental review are ongoing. They're a big uh, portion of the Long Range Planning Citywide's work program, and they're at a broader level of detail as a programmatic EIR would be. You're saying it's a collaborative effort between Mr. Malter, who's retired, Mr. Jacinto, who's not here, and Ms. Weiss? I am. Okay. Uh, this must be a pretty tiny office. So no one, no one signed off on it. And just to add to that, no, did one person sign off on it? You know, somebody knowledgeable who to Mr. make Mr. Malter signed the negative Mr. Malter. Okay, that that's fine. And then, uh, at, at, and at, at what stage was this before his retirement? I hope. Yes, yes it was published right. some time ago. Okay. As Victoria notes. What was Mr. Jacinto, who is in charge of the Eastern Neighborhood Rezoning? An area plans EIR. He was involved, though. He was, and I did consult staff from our citywide division uh, while preparing the neg deck. Okay, so the the neg deck that's on pages 12 to 15 discusses planning commission resolution 16727 on the eastern neighborhoods planning process and how projects are to be evaluated. Is that right? So, what was the date of that resolution? I'm sorry, Supervisor Armion, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I think it was in February, but we'll check into it. And ha has there been an evolution of thinking in the department since that date? As, as to what? Well, in, in, in you know, in, in uh, connection to the thinking, about what that resolution said, has there been further analysis and an evolution of that thinking from the department, from planning uh, planning director, from Mr. Green to Mr. Macris? Uh, it hasn't been in stasis, I imagine. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Amory Rogers from the planning department. Uh, the Eastern Neighborhoods rezoning effort is an ongoing effort that is in progress, and so the, the draft environmental review document is a draft document that contains maps that we are continually updating throughout the process. Right. Yeah, the uh, the neg deck seems to make a distinction between areas in the mission that are zoned industrial and those zoned neighborhood commercial or residential. Does the MEA think the mission area plan is only concerned about PDR uses? that happen to be in industrial zones? No, we look at the neighborhood as a whole, not solely PDR and is or the versus MCA. Okay. That is, ME, is the MEA aware that neighborhood commercial districts, for example, the Kelly Moore site, are also being rezoned? Yes, and under all three um, rezoning proposals, they would go to NC2 which is a mixed-use district that would allow the mixed-use proposal under all three scenarios under Eastern Neighborhoods. Also, I'd like to speak to the fact that the Eastern Neighborhoods DEIR um, did uh, call out the paint stores as, as PDR. And uh, the... The development in the plan, as you're aware of planning efforts, they go from concept to to draft, and the final plan is is not is not honed down till after the EIR is done. At the beginning, 
the first cut at land use for existing land uses was based on SIC classifications, which, which scooped, um, scooped up uh, paint stores. Um, and it's become more finely honed to where um, on a site-by-site -site basis we look at the use and for this case it is retail as defined by 790.102. It's not a wholesale use and it is not PDR. All right, but on page 15 you talk about this board's resolution on 2660 Harrison. So does MEA think that, uh, that that decision only dealt with preserving PDR? No. No. There were three criteria mm -hmm. in, and Paul, in Paul's memo that interpreted for our, for our working environment how to do environmental review. We, we took a large number of projects and said they would be EIR projects if they proceeded ahead of Eastern Neighborhoods EIR. Projects that, and there was a list of them which I believe that you saw which indicated projects that might, if they met the three criteria that Paul laid out in his memo, not a loss of PDR, not a land use conflict, and not interfere with the ha housing elements, um, ability to meet San Francisco's housing needs, could possibly go further. And we felt that 3400 Cesar Chavez met, met those tests. You know, the, the board is free to, to make another decision. Yeah, we, we know. There's no discussion, Neg Dick, of, of the board resolution instructing on issues in the Eastern Neighborhoods plan that we adopted on uh, January 9th of this year. Was, was MEA informed of that resolution? Supervisors, there's no discussion because the Neg Dick was published prior to that. Because the resolution tells planning to come forward with a plan that addresses city affordability goals. So. What are the affordability levels in this project and, and how do they compare to the goals in the housing element? The affordability levels for this project are nine BMR units and that represents 15% of the total units. 15. 15. Yeah, yeah. The NEG deck says that the project is consistent with the housing element because why? It, it, inc legally, it includes legally required inclusionary units. That, that's correct, and that's the test we use to determine. Analysis of the housing is, okay, is on Neg Deck page 18. How does MEA staff review a project against the housing element? Like, what parts do you look to? Well, as you know, we have a big checklist that includes a lot of topics, and we consider the general plan for for each topic as it as it pertains to physical impacts on the environment. How do you evaluate the cost of the units against the housing element goals in terms of level of affordability? Well, I have to say that the CEQA requires that we not distinguish as to who the housing occupants are and what the price is. The price of a unit is not a physical impact on the environment. We look to see how many cars they have based on census tract ownership and so on and so forth. We actually talk about compatibility with, with zoning and plans in a section of our environmental documents that precedes the e-checklist, the physical impact section. And we note that the general plan contains policies that may conflict with each other, that may address different goals, and the decision makers need on balance to decide whether a project conforms to the general plan. Where, there, where the transportation element, for example, uh, talks about issues that have physical impacts, we address those issues in the topic section of transportation. So that basically, I mean, I suppose we could write more about the housing element if, if People felt it was warranted, but we have a housing staff that maintains the residence element, and that's part of the citywide work program. Yeah, so I don't know if I've answered your question fully. Supervisor, well, I, yeah. just jump in with sure, a please. little question here. Not to muddy the waters here, and I know this is just going to make Ms. Warren 
go cross-eyed, but given the action of the appellate court in the environmental review matter of the housing element, how does that all add up relative to your housing element checklist? Do we have a housing element? Well, you've been advised by the city attorney to... Well, I can just say how we responded to it for this neck deck, and Elaine can answer. Basically, we have checked, again, this is a recent court case. I note that it's unpublished, so I don't know if it's actually case law, but... It is unpublished. Elaine Warren, Deputy City Attorney. The status of the current 2004 housing element obviously is in somewhat of a state of flux. That decision is not final. As you know, we're evaluating our options on the outcome of that. However, we are operating under the assumption that a prudent course of action would be to compare projects against both the 2004 housing element and the 1990 housing element, which we assume would go into effect in the event the 2004 housing element was found to be no longer in effect. And I believe that the planning department has looked at that issue for this project, and some one of the planners here could inform you on the relative comparisons between those two documents and how it applies to this project, if you would like to know that. Carol Roos again. Victoria did prepare a memo on the consistency with the 1990 residence element for this project for the file. If you would like copies, I can hand them over to you. Would you like that? Yeah. And in the meantime, this project is what they call a planned unit development, and the PND discussion is on pages 11 and 12. It mentions that the sponsor is requesting increased density, more units than the code permits. I think it's 51, 60 instead of 51. Did you consult with the long-term planning about whether the mission area would allow PUDs? No, Supervisor, I did not. Okay. Is Mr. Rich here? Mr. Rich? There you are. Supervisor Ken Rich with the planning department. I'm the project manager for the Eastern Neighborhoods long-range planning effort. And to clarify on the PUDs, PUDs currently offer several advantages to project sponsors. The most prominent of them is probably an ability to do increased density. Because the proposal in the Eastern Neighborhoods is wherever housing is allowed, the density maximums would be removed. So the density maximums, if the proposed zoning is adopted by this board, would no longer be relevant. Numbers of units would be controlled by the height and bulk of buildings. So a project sponsor would not need to request a PUD for that purpose. PUDs also offer other advantages in terms of reorganizing required open space and some other physical issues. And we would continue to allow PUDs for those issues. But the density issue would be moot. And I'm just curious, PUDs, haven't they been abolished in certain areas, Rincon, downtown plan? You know, I have to say, I don't know if Anne Marie, I didn't work on the Rincon plan, and I'm not aware one way or the other on that one. Okay. Isn't planning intending to require additional affordability beyond what the code currently requires if additional goodies like additional units or height is allowed? Yes, Supervisor. The proposal that, you know, is working its way through and has been talked with the Planning Commission and a bit through the Land Use Committee would propose to require additional inclusionary housing for parcels that have been, that have, through the change in zoning, received the ability to do more units. So if we've done one of two things, either remove that density cap that I mentioned, thereby allowing more density, or raise the heights, then we would propose through the Eastern Neighborhood Zoning to require something back in the form of inclusionary housing. Okay. But isn't the thrust of the Eastern Neighborhood plans is figuring out how to get more affordable housing, not giving it away via PUD? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. The thrust of our efforts are to do as, get as close to that 64 percent level as we can. Increase affordability, right. And by virtue of the fact that we're already thinking of increasing density in certain areas, that's one way to get it, yes. But it also seems that you, 
that you've given something away by doing that in terms of the... The thrust is that we are increasing the value of some of that property and that it's reasonable and feasible to ask for some additional affordable housing back in that case. All right. It seems a little contradictory to me, but... Thank you, Mr. Rich. Ms. Wise, the recent Eastern Neighborhood DEIR talks about how thinking has evolved on the supply of PDR space. On pages one through six, there's a discussion of the economics and planning system study done in 2005 for planning. That study notes at the bottom of the page that the city would have to actively work to retain PDR uses in the future by allowing PDR uses to remain in place despite not having been in areas zoned for PDR use. The NEG deck states that the Kelly Moore site was not PDR. So did you review whether the long-term planning staff dealing with the mission considered this to be a PDR site? Yes, Supervisor Romano, I did. And in fact, the site is considered to be a retail site and the citywide planning staff concurs with that determination. Okay. And as Supervisor Peskin and colleagues, I appreciate the time. I will try to wrap up and also have more questions. But I think while I'm frustrated, it seems to me from years of dealing with the planning department that Mr. Jarmillo and Ms. Hoeda are experts about this, but they're not allowed to attend this meeting. Is that right? No, that's incorrect. Staff Teresa Hoeda is actually here and can speak to some of the affordability issues. That would be great. In addition, as far as what this project is giving in respect to the project approvals, it did come before the rezoning, so it didn't benefit from the rezoning, but it did agree to pay for 15% inclusionary as opposed to a 12% requirement. And they also, the planning commission imposed a fee of $13 per square foot for residential development and $4 per square foot for commercial development. Okay, thanks. Ms. Hoeda, I'm just trying to nail this. The paint dealers are considered wholesalers, so that Kelly Moore would be a PDR? Hi, Emory Rogers from the planning department. No, in this case, they are not a wholesaler because they did not offer exclusively a wholesale for supplies. Anything per the planning code that offers both wholesale and retail is considered a retail establishment if it's open to the public. In fact, if it were a wholesale use, it would not be allowed at this particular location and it would be noted on our notes as a non-conforming use or a limited LCU, and it is not so noted. So all material indicates that this is a retail. Were you aware that this site is designated existing PDR on the mission map in the ENDEIR? Yes, the department is aware that it's indicated as a PDR use on those maps. Those maps are part of the evolving dialogue and are meant to indicate uses generally over the area. But when we go through specific project approvals, we are able to refine that through human analysis. That's very convenient, but did you seek any kind of clarification from long-term planning? Because it's a discrepancy. Yes, it is, and I did consult with citywide staff, and we are all in concurrence that this is a retail site. Okay, who told you in planning that the proper designation of this site under the terms of the Eastern Neighborhoods planning process was retail? Are you going to tell me that there was a collaboration again? Yes, there's a meeting. There are many people there, and we all concurred. I don't suppose there's minutes of that meeting. Do you know what designation is being proposed for this site in the mission area plan? Supervisor Ken Rich with the citywide section of the department. It's proposed to be zoned NCT, which is a variation. Neighborhood commercial transit. Neighborhood commercial. I have a map I can show you, but that's basically the proposal. And how is the parking handled in the proposed NCT? In terms of requirements? Yeah. You know, we haven't nailed that down, but the proposal right now would probably, and, you know, this is just a proposal, be a maximum of one-to-one parking. One-to-one. And no minimum. And are locations like the intersection of Mission and Cesar Chavez given special attention because of our potential for parking traffic conflicts? Yes, we would consider as going through that, basically our thinking at this point is that certain parts of the mission 
might want to benefit from the C3, more restrictive parking, and certain parts probably in the Northeast Mission would make sense with what I just said. So I, I couldn't tell you where we've landed on this site yet. So the, about the retail spaces, how is parking proposed to be handled? I understand there's 25 spaces. Does the mission area plan encourage that amount of parking? The, we, we haven't gotten this far on the commercial side. Our general uh, our direction has been to cap commercial parking at the current requirements and not allow more than that and allow as little below that as the project sponsor wanted to do. Do you know the size of the proposed Walgreens? You know, other folks know it's something around 15,000 feet, I believe. Is that, is that correct? 12,000, excuse me. So then the proposed maximum size for an individual retail space is 5,000 square feet according to the Eastern Neighborhoods DEIR. Can you repeat that? I didn't yeah. quite catch that. Are you aware that according to the Eastern Neighborhoods DEIR, the proposed maximum size for an individual retail space is 5,000 square feet? Yes. This is obviously coming in under existing controls, not the proposed new ones. So what does the proposed mission plan have to say about large chain retail, particularly Walgreens? So far, the, the plan hasn't addressed that. We certainly have heard from folks that, you know, there will be a discussion of formula retail controls in the mission. Uh, we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. Yeah, it would be good if it was consistent with the, with the uh, proposed mission area plan. And Mr. Rich, as long as I have you, when the board adopted the 2660 Harrison findings, we asked that attention be paid to the housing element goals on all projects in the eastern neighborhoods. And on August 21st, 2006, Dean Mack was sent me a memo on individual projects in the post-2660 Harrison decision era. And he said that 13 projects need to be looked at as to their, their effect on the PDR loss. Uh, I'm just curious, are you familiar with that memo? Uh, not specifically. That predates when I came on to this project, Supervisor. Uh -huh. This memo says that because Kelly Moore sold paint as retail as well as wholesale, it was retail. So. Wait, it was retail or it was PDR? PDR. Did, did, I'm sorry. Did long-term planning respond that it was PDR on your maps, though? We, as it's been explained a couple times, we, um, in the mapping process, they go through a series of kind of iterations that look at SIC codes and kind of high level, and it got swept up under that as PDR. Yeah, it got, th I think that's why I'm troubled by, by the memo, because I think it does ignore the policies regarding the needs to increase the supply of affordable housing and emission in other, Eastern, other uh, Eastern neighborhoods. And the, these issues were raised to Mr. Macris by, I wondered if they were raised to Mr. Macris by long-term planning. The issues around, can you kind of repeat that? Well, the, I'm having a problems why I, I do think the memo was somewhat troubling because I think it ignored the policies regarding the need to increase the supply of affordable housing and emission. And I wondered if those issues uh, raised were raised to Mr. Macris by the long-term planning. Well, what I, what I can tell you, Supervisor, is in the re proposed rezoning, it's a, a central part of our thinking. And, you know, we, we are focusing in long-term planning on getting the proposed rezoning done and to you as soon as possible so we can kind of avoid having this come up. And, and that's, that's what I've been working on. And All certainly, right, well, yeah, I, I just think, you know, there's some interpretations that are happening here that are, are not matched to what the intent is, and, and, and I believe how it was spelled out, because we did pass a resolution in January of this year, and we spent a lot of time and effort conducting hearings, meeting with the community, and planning staff to develop our resolution, establishing a policy for the Eastern Neighborhoods rezoning and community area plans, and I think, see, what I'm hearing, I don't, I don't feel that it's mirroring that, and I think that the resolution clearly states that we want planning to be looking at housing in the eastern neighborhoods with eyes that uh, prioritize housing that meets the affordability goals in the housing element. I think it's 28 percent of all. And, you know, I think there's, there's been a misfire here. Um, how is planning or, or how is MEA looking at individual project in terms of the city's ability uh, in, in the eastern neighborhoods to, you know, to, to meet those goals? Again, we're back to the criteria that I described, and essentially if a proposed project, we're looking at them on a case-by-case -case basis, and if a proposed project meets the inclusionary housing ordinance, then it passes that test. 
So are you just looking at uh, industrially zoned areas? Are, are sites in the neighborhood commercial zones also possible sites? Uh, we're looking They're at also, everything. Okay. All right, that, that's my questions for now. Thank you, Supervisor, if, if I may, I'm sure. sorry. I just would like to clarify. I've got a little additional information from my staff, Mr. Lipsky, who's our Director of Development, and Mr. Shoemaker, my deputy, who was involved in uh, this more directly than I. Just a couple of clarifications on your questions around price. There, there are 16,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, uh, the assumptions that I outlined of how to discount that on a per unit uh, is not how my staff went about it. They've informed me in an email. They did not have access to any comps or evaluation on the commercial space. Uh, they did uh, uh, state a um, uh, assessment that the site was suitable for affordable housing per your question, uh, but they did not have any direct communications about the overall price uh, prior to the offer being made. All right, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, President Peskin and colleagues. Ma'am, are you with the department? I'm Teresa O'Hither with the Planning Department, and I would like to talk about the uh, housing element and the uh, affordability goals. Um, uh, colleagues, you would like to hear about the housing element and the affordability goals? I don't think it's we have right. any questions for you, and the department's time is up. And if we do have questions for you, we will let you know. Why don't we go to the real party in interest or their representative? Uh, good afternoon, President Peskin, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Steve Vettel with Varela Brown and Martell, the attorney for the project sponsor, uh, Tom Rocca of Seven Hills Properties, a small local development company. As you've heard from the planning department, this is a hearing only on the CEQA compliance of this negative declaration. The only question is whether the planning department was wrong when they found that on nearly a nearly unanimous six to one vote, that the NEGDEC adequately addresses and analyzes all of the environmental issues and that there is no substantial evidence in the record that this project would have any significant impacts on the physical environment. CEQA compliance is a technical question only. Does the NEGDEC provide adequate information on environmental impacts? Answering that question should be immune from political interpretations and I would ask that you do that. Before discussing the project's CEQA compliance, I do feel compelled to briefly describe the 3400 Cesar Chavez project and the tremendous community benefits that Tom has added at the request of the neighborhood. As you know, there are 60 residential units, fully half of which are two and three bedroom units, all entry level family housing over a ground floor pharmacy and other retail space. Fully 15% of the units are below market rate inclusionary units. The planning code requires only 12%. We voluntarily increased that to 15%. We've agreed to provide at least $13 a square foot in community infrastructure benefits, including widened sidewalks, median landscaping, and low rent commercial space for MEPI, the Mission Educational Projects, Inc. There'll be 120 union construction jobs and about 48 permanent union jobs at the Walgreens. Let me briefly address the PUD issue. Uh, uh, under a PUD, we'd be allowed to, to build 70 units. We're proposing only 60 units. We're proposing no increase in height. This is in a 50-foot height limit district. We're proposing only a four-story building so that we can have a generous ground floor. It's not a five-story building. It's only a four-story building at a very modest density. <clears throat> we believe that the merits of this project are tremendous, and it has tremendous community support. However, let me repeat again that the merits of the development are not what is before the board. Uh, neither is the general plan consistency, which was decided on the conditional use process. Uh, it was the conditional use process that looked at policy issues and general plan issues. That conditional use, which was approved by the Planning Commission in April, was not appealed and is not before you. The Planning Department and the Planning Commission correctly determined that there is no substantial evidence that the project may significantly affect the environment. Over the past two and a half years, the Planning Department undertook technical careful technical analyses of every CEQA issue, including traffic, land use compatibility, any potential displacement of PDR uses or industrial land, general plan compliance, including affordability housing.